Well, a very good morning to many of you, a good afternoon to some of you, and a good evening to probably a smaller number of you. My name is uh, Balwan Singh, and I'm the Executive Director of Sphere. Uh, welcome to this Sphere webinar, which is part of an initiative on applying humanitarian standards to the global COVID-19 response. The aim is to build the capacity and understanding of humanitarian actors uh, on relevant humanitarian standards for the COVID-19 response. This includes SPHERE standards, the core humanitarian standard, and the humanitarian standards partnership standards. This webinar is a part of a series of seven webinars on, this, on the standards that I've mentioned and their application. The webinars present current and emerging guidance on humanitarian standards, including guidance which was issued by SPHERE in March of this year. The webinars will also signpost participants to existing resources and share good practice examples from community-led responses. Now, the webinars are delivered in a partnership uh, which includes SPHERE, the CHS Alliance, the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, and many local partners, including many of the partners from uh, South America who are participating in today's webinar. Uh, let me now hand you over to my colleague, Aninia Nadik, who leads SPHERE's policy and practice work, to tell you more about this particular webinar. Thank you very much. Sí, buenos días a todos y todas. Um, bienvenidos uh, a ese webinar. To this webinar, and thank you very much for your interest in today's theme. I would like to say something about the region we're going to cover today, which is South America, and we're also going to organize a webinar soon enough about Central America and the Caribbean. Today, we're going to focus on South America. The effects of humanitarian response in uh, displaced people and their challenges are not focused in Latin America and it's a phenomenon that is increasing increasingly important everywhere and we can see that that it comes from over 60 different countries there are many reasons why uh, we might migrate involuntarily but they are connected to many aspects of insecurity, violence, and increasingly more to climate change that impacts the quality of life of many people. Our intention today is to combine three things. One, examples of humanitarian response by uh, people on the move, the right to manage COVID-19, the challenge, and the humanitarian, the existing humanitarian standards, uh, Sphere, CHS, and others that could be helpful. The question of human mobility is not present in the Sphere handbook today or the core humanitarian standard. This condition of people on the move challenges the way in which we tend to work and neither of the key features will disappear in the years to come. That's why we have to adapt to this change. And I know that today's discussion will be able to contribute to this end. And so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our facilitator, Jose Felix Rodriguez. Here we are. Here, Jose Felix Rodriguez, who is our facilitator today. He is from Venezuela. His seat, his office is in Panama, and he's currently living in lockdown in Buenos Aires. He works in the Red Cross since 2014. He's regional coordinator 
Regional Migration, Inclusion, and Nonviolence Coordination in the IFRC Panama, Panama Regional Office. He's also an expert in migration issues. And he developed the current action plan for migration in the region, and he's responsible for the migration program of the regional office, and he's in charge of the operations in emergency and long-term and mid-term and short-term plans with all the uh, sub-regions uh, migration flow. So he is aware of what we were talking about. He has worked a lot on human rights in Venezuela and many other things that we are going to be unable to mention today. He studied law and hu human rights. Jose Felix, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. And thank you very much to our executive director for his opening remarks. I want to welcome you all who are joining us today. We have 120 people connected in this at this moment. As our colleague said, we try to make out of this place a place to re uh, reflect on migration and the lessons learned that we have had in South America in the context of COVID-19. So during this day, we will have different activities, questions, Q&As, where we will be able to interact with each and every one of you. The first thing I would like to share with you is the are the objectives if we can share the screen thank you very much to the organizing team for helping us today the ideal thing right now is to be able to go over the objectives and to remember that we're going to uh, point out uh, to highlight the state of migration flows, especially in South America. We know that there are other regions and um, we are going to be open to other questions, but we're going not, we are not going to focus on another areas but South America to explore the complexity of humanitarian aid to people on the move and how COVID-19 impacted their response. We remind you all that if you have your microphones on, please keep it silent or muted. Another of the objectives is to analyze so discuss response modalities, including in-kind services and cash-based assistance, discuss inclusion of at-risk groups, of those groups that have been invisibilized during response, as well as identify positive examples and challenges in the application of sphere standards in humanitarian response, especially in everything related to migration in South America, as well as collect other examples and also lessons learned to be able to have this rich exchange. Today we're going to have a discussion that we hope can be very dynamic with a lot of participation and engagement, and we have many uh, many people who will make a very rich conversation for all participants. But before we begin with the dynamic of this activity, I will give the floor to Barbara, our colleague, who is with the team uh, controlling everything we are unable to control with, it, with technology and this new way of meeting so that she can explain to us how we will be working and how we are going to work with this new platform. Thank you. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm Barbara. I am the uh, communication manager for Sphere. Welcome, everyone. Here are some housekeeping instructions so that our webinar is uneventful. First and foremost, please mute your microphones when you're not speaking. Thank you very much in advance.
If you have any questions, you can write it down in the chat. Our team is monitoring the chat, and we are going to alert some the others when a question is published. Thank you very much, Manisha, Jonathan, and the people who are monitoring the chat. By the end of the webinar, we are going to divide ourselves in different breakout rooms for some minutes. Participants will be divided according to language, and we're going to have groups in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. It is an opportunity for exchange, for exchanging of experiences, and also establishing contact with other professionals. No, never mind if you don't feel like actively participating, but please stay with us because we will communicate something that is very important after the breakout room sessions. Please remember to fill out the evaluation of the assessment form after the webinar. This is very important to understand and to learn from you and to improve webinars in the future. One last thing, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording and the presentation online. Very important information about accessibility. We expect our webinar to be as inclusive as possible, and that's why we do our best effort to offer interpretation and live captions. Today, we have a great team of interpreters and captioners who have joined us to make this possible, and I would like to thank them all. To activate captions into Spanish, please click on the CC button that is at the bottom of the screen, and this should activate the captions. Right next to the CC channel, you will see a globe that says interpretation. If you click there, you will be able to choose between English Spanish and Portuguese, so that you can listen to the interpreter of your choice. If you are connected through your microphone, you will have to click on the three dots. In any case, if you have any problems, please write in the chat and our team will be there to help you. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy the seminar and please, Felix, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara. With this description, we hope to be clear throughout the meeting, but please feel free to ask any question in the chat about the content, but uh, about the platform, platform in case we have any problem. To all the team will be ready to provide an answer and help you out. Please remember that we are going to we be assessing this and we will share the link. So when you finish, you will be able to assess the quality of the activity. In order to kick off the activity and to put ourselves in context as to what we expect from this activity, it is very important to get acquainted with one another and uh, see who is joining us. Today, we will be joined by people who have a lot to share with you, with us. Um, regarding the topics we will be focusing on. We have a keynote speaker who is going to uh, provide an overview. And uh, she is Ingrid Kufveld, who has a BA in business, a master's degree in social development. And after devoting to the business sector, she has refocused on the social area. And she has been active in these topics for over 25 years. 21 of them had been in the international spheres in different countries. Also, uh, she has uh, joined uh, other organizations and from the peace efforts, from the uh, humanitarian perspective, supporting different NGOs. She is currently member of the board of directors of uh, the Colombian uh, Women Board, and she's responsible for regional programs also. And we also have the presence of Eliane Giacarini, 
who is the program director of ADRA Argentina, the sphere focal point um, that provides emergency response and technical laboratories for um, transference. He's also a sphere trainer since 2015 and in Argentina he has trained people from the civil society, Red Cross, the state and the uh, armed forces. Uh, he's currently developing uh, the ADRA programs and the recovery of people who are in need for protection in Argentina and the people affected by emergencies and disasters. As members of the response team, Elian has participated in humanitarian missions within the framework of the Venezuelan crisis. He's also uh, in charge of the response in case of the Irma and Maria hurricane in 2008. We also have with us Luis Francisco Cabezas, politology specialist in social programs, and he um, has a uh, participation in uh, social participation. He is a participant of CONVITE, uh, director general of CONVITE, who works in the um, social rights, a special emphasis of in power on the problems of people who are especially vulnerable. He is uh, developing humanitarian problem, um, programs in Venezuela as part of the Venezuelan space. We also have uh, Marilyn Bonfante, who is uh, a, red, a member of Red Cross Colombian. He is an, a professional nurse with a specialization in public health management. He's, she's currently social and humanitarian development, res, uh, responsible for social and humanitarian development. And she has over 25 years working in the Red Cross movement, and she has been the executive director also of one special section in Bolivar. She is a teacher from the uh, University of Cartagena and also from the Rafael Nunez University. Marilyn has been responsible for the response of my Venezuelan migration, especially in Colombia, with the Red Cross operation in Colombia. Finally, we will have Alvaro Gramajo. He is Uruguayan. He is currently living in Brazil and he is the coordinator of uh, Red Cross management in your way. But also, Alvaro has participated, has been trained in the Red Cross movement as a, um, a specialized personnel uh, in crisis and disaster management. He's currently coordinator of um, the Vermela, uh, Cruz Vermela, coordinated to um, the attention to migrant population in Brazil, fundamentally, mainly the Venezuelan migrants. You can see the pic his picture in this presentation. With this, I would like to begin this uh, presentation that with Ingrid's uh, overview. Ingrid, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jose Felix, and thanks, Fier, for organizing this seminar. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for your participation. I believe at this moment, where we are going through the new normal, a place for reflection is highly important, especially in this context in which humanitarian response is vital to those under vulnerable circumstances. Within the general context, I've been asked to introduce the region of South America, and I wanted to talk about a few main ideas or pointers. Uh, perhaps some will not fit the screens. Thank you for understanding. Now, speaking about South America, one of the things that we have observed since before the pandemic 
started is to see how migration flows have been modified in this part of the continent. These are flows that before they were south to north are changing now and movements that we are not used to, including the new migratory routes and the shift west, east, north, south. And so we are trying to see what has happened in countries in South America in, that in the past were immigrating into other northern countries or European countries, and that now they are receiving people, especially the case of Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Colombia. We are receiving heavy migration that we were definitely not ready for. For instance, the new migratory flow for, from people from Haiti who are trying to find better opportunities and therefore have changed their flows and are going into South America to then go back to uh, Central America to move on to North America eventually. Then there's migratory flow that is um, minor that comes from Western Africa and that are following the illegal trafficking uh, routes that have existed and have been opened and that nowadays have a greater emphasis in human trafficking. So um, there's also the issue of migratory flow and this has to do with people coming from Venezuela. This has been massive and the migratory crisis is where we find people living from Venezuela at a very vulnerable stage and with a lower capacity of managing their lives as compared to the first two migratory waves from Venezuela. So these countries that in the past would generate migration, and in the case of Colombia, Ecuador, and so on and so forth, have become hosts for these new migratory waves and they were not ready for it. Therefore, having found a network of support institutional that are weak, institutional support that is weak. So within this framework, we find that there is official and unofficial or informal migration that have different consequences. One example that I will talk about is the example of Colombia, where officially we have two entry points, two access points from Venezuela to Colombia, and that's what the Colombian government is monitoring as the number of migrants that are uh, reaching the country. However, our border is very vast and quite permeable, allowing for over 200 entry points at informal level for people who are arriving to the country and who are not being counted. That is to say, those who are using these informal entry points become invisible, so to speak, in terms of control of arrival, follow-up, records. Therefore, at no point can they become legal or have access to basics. So this generates exclusion and discrimination at a higher level, given that our responses in terms of government responses as well as the humanitarian sector are targeted at people that can be found, recorded, and that also have a minimum stay at a certain location. This minimum stay, I'm talking about um, 
there are some population groups that don't fit this because within migrants there are different profiles that are mixed between people who are displaced, violence, people who are affected by the critical situation of Venezuela, for instance, and people who swing, let's say, and that are coming in and out of the country and then going back to their country to do paperwork or because they have relatives there. There is a group, however, that is a group that is constantly on the move and this generates the difficulty of reaching them within the realm of humanitarian aid. So for governments of receiving countries, in this case in South America, we find that support is limited, is a little indirect perhaps in some cases, because although we are not actually rejecting people from coming in and we're not preventing people from coming in. There's lack of an institutional response, especially for those who enter informally. So in this case, although national authorities may be willing to give some sort of support, local authorities on the contrary are not so positive in terms of providing support, sometimes even preventing humanitarian aid workers from acting. We find that there are many challenges that we were not waiting for. One is that many of our humanitarian processes have been developed for groups of people who are temporarily located at some geographic space, at some location. And it is hard, or rather, it is hard to provide an answer to those that are constantly on the move. We find that given the absence of strong institutional presence in different cross points, these migrants are victims, not only of migration, not only of the consequences of migration, but victims of mobs, criminal mobs that have uh, taken control of informal entry points affecting the rights of these people, sometimes costing their lives or taking young members to be criminals in the places where they operate. To be able to implement humanitarian standards and uh, complying with the objectives of CHS to provide people in a vulnerable situation a help that is timely enough appropriate and relevant are new challenges to us in this sector as to how to provide an accountability in an effective manner in the humanitarian sector. This is a great challenge because we are not thinking in terms of populations that do not are not stable in a specific place. For example, in Colombia and Ecuador, we see people walking by that do not spend even one night uh, in a single place. And they go to Argentina, Chile, Peru, and we are facing a situation of uh, migration flow a group of people that are constantly moving and we weren't able to reach them or develop as humanitarian actors a network to uh, provide the appropriate attention to these groups of people, creating a greater discrimination. Also, we find that if we had 
these challenges before pandemic, what has happened during the pandemic is an additional vulnerability since the solidarity they could find in the way the little solidarity they were finding from common citizens was no longer available to them due to the fear of contagion due to social distancing so there are people who are literally spending months by the roads by the side of the road trying to find uh, minimum ways to survive with minimum support except when they reach urban centers where they receive information on the places where they can find uh, support but very limited and uh, for a brief period of time because most of them are trying to reach places where they understand they can find uh, a way to settle down easier and to try and, and get a better future. As I was saying, our biggest challenge is, one of our biggest challenges is to serve populations on the move. Also, to understand the consequences in terms of the people who are left behind in the, the places of origin. For example, we are finding that um, elderly people are left behind and uh, or left uh, with no attention with the attention of uh, grandchildren and they used to have a protection network before families started migrating and they re they are uh, left with no protection at all when um, once the members of their families emigrate so we found these older people um, migrating along with their families, especially women, because they are still in charge of their grandchildren and they are still in charge of supporting the families as a protector of uh, children or other people with disabilities, uh, while the adults try to find a, 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 a mean uh, to um, a means to uh, their survival. So this has to do with how to uh, we can apply the outlines, the guidelines of sphere uh, of this CHS alliance of the essential principles for the humanitarian work and that the support is effective and relevant for the different profiles we are finding and that are generating a problem we are not as familiar and also how to um, make the humanitarian response more flexible to this group of migrants, how to help them strengthen the institutional uh, network of services, of uh, basic services in the receptive countries. Um, there are many problems even before for their own population, how we can strengthen the response to groups to strengthen and avoid discrimination so that they can be inclusive responses, including the basic rights of migrants. So far, this brief account of the reality we are experiencing in South America, Jose Felix, I give you the floor. Thank you very much for this space. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Time is always limited to focus on these themes that are mixed movements and that pass perhaps unnoticed. And all of this highlight the vulnerability and make the humanitarian work even more important, and especially this constant change that demands changes from us. In order to be part of these challenges you mentioned, we would like to explore 
the responses and we will start at, um, with an in exchange process. For that, we would like to invite you to participate of a poll that we're going to conduct right now. In a few minutes, with the support from the technical team, you will be able to access in your platform and choose the response, the answer. Please. Focus on uh, the question and uh, possible answers. If you do not see them, please let us know. The first question, these are the two questions. Please scroll down to make sure you see both of them. First question, in which region are you based, currently based? And second, for the people in South America, in where are you now, in which country? Once you choose your answer, please press submit. Very well. If you all participated, please let us let us know when the results are ready. America, 6% from Asia, 3% from Africa, and 8% from Europe, 1% from Middle East and North Africa, 9% from North America, and 1% from Oceania. These leaders to 27% of the people who are in South America. We have participants from Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, 12, 4, and 10%. Accordingly, um, Chile, 1%, Colombia, 18%, Ecuador, 8%, Peru, 11%, Venezuela, 6%, and 4% from other countries in South America. Oh, and we love to see so much diversity in our region and outside our region in this context. With this, I would like to launch the next question of our poll. Please, if we can see the image of the poll. Challenges. We hope you are all being able to see the questions. And the question now is, what do you see as the biggest challenges when responding to the needs of people on the move? This question is a multiple choice question. You can choose many. First could be the lack of understanding of the problem, the difficulty to coordinate at intergovernmental levels and border issues, lack of funding for assistance, lack of technical expertise, and difficulty to assess needs and monitor and evaluate the response. If you think, please, there is another possibility, please say so and include it in the chat so that we can warn the rest about other challenges that you might be confronting.
So far, we have 53% of the responses. One more minute so that everyone can complete it. We can see in the chat box uh, some answers that have not been offered as a possibility. You will be able to see them. We have 70% of the answers as there we have the results to revise. We have, for example, the main answer with 65%, uh, people have chosen the difficulty to coordinate at intergovernmental levels and border issues. Second, we have a tie between the lack of funding for assistance and the difficulty to assess needs and monitor and evaluate the response. Followed by lack of understanding of the problem, lack of technical expertise, and 11% of other difficulties mentioning some of the uh, included in the chat, such as the question of language, um, lack of volunteers. Uh, we are unable to provide incentives, lack of health service or education access, and uh, lack of uh, response from local organizations. It is difficult to contribute to the um, insurance of rights to people who cross or enter countries from uh, irregular borders and the difficulty to articulate with um, entities, governmental entities, lack of proper mapping of affected population, um, enforcement of sphere standards due to the COVID context, the compliance with sphere standards due to a context by COVID, as Rodolfo said, we all have these type of difficulties. There are very many now, and I'm sure we are going to continue exploring them during, during our conversation. With this, We have the last poll for this session, and it's the first best to lead us to reflect on the different stages and challenges of in the in South America within COVID. the framework of COVID. So now we're going to keep uh, talking about the discussion with our panelists and Right now, I think uh, it's a good time to ask panelists to be uh, careful and watchful, rather, to my questions so that they can share their feedback. So the first thing that we wanted to uh, talk about, as uh, Ingrid was saying, many flows, many movements, many complexities, things that are happening in this region. There's uh, one thing that has actually caught our attention, and we'll start by this one. That is the Venezuelan migration. The situation in Colombia and in the border in Venezuela is very complex for several reasons, especially because of an environmental element that is the extension of the border that is the border is about 2000 K from the Atlantic Caribbean coast to the Brazilian Amazon. So that means that there's a big stretch of land and also it's to do with other elements that are related to trade and a social 
an historical exchange between these two countries. So I would like to ask two people who represent organizations that are neighbors to Venezuela. So I would like to ask especially to Marilyn Bonfante, what is the biggest challenge for the Colombian Red Cross regarding migration and migrants in general, in particular in the COVID context. So can you hear uh, Marilyn and would you like to take over? Thank you so much, Jose Felix. And I would like to uh, say hello. Thank you for being here and for having me. Definitely for Colombia, it is quite hard to talk about just one challenge. There are multiple challenges in terms of migratory assistance in the country, the complexities of a situation that is quite diverse, such as the one we're having, not only regarding Venezuelan um, migrants, but transcontinental that have been displaced. So there is a situation in which there is internal displacement that is quite critical people who come back, and that's important too. And also a question of unmet needs of the host population. I think this is uh, interesting. Currently, according to Colombian migration, there's approximately 1.8 million migrants who already are residents in Colombia. In the past weeks, this has gone down by 6% almost, because some uh, people have come back to Venezuela. And from this 1.8% of migrants, almost 1 million is under informal settings, let's say they haven't complied with all the requirements, they're not legal uh, residents. This means that they are exposed to situations that are that mean that they are more vulnerable and cannot access the same uh, in the same way aid also there are 1500 transcontinental migrants and we know that probably this is not the only ones and the history places us in the world ranking as one of the countries that have the highest number of internal displacement in the last year only 530,000 were reported so this is a big challenge for us the situation is complex diverse so additionally the installed capacity of essential services, housing, work that used to be deficient in the past for the Colombian population. And to this, we will add the need that migrants uh, bring over to Colombia. So also the fact that this crisis has continued for so long, over three years, that is deepened with the appearances of other crises such as the COVID now and some other situations related to armed conflict. I think this for the Colombian Red Cross and for Colombia, this presents a huge risk in terms of migratory issues over to you thank you marilyn that gives us a very specific context not only for venezuela migration but um things that are co-current so that's why i would like to ask alvaro in this regard another of the neighboring countries to venezuela how is it in this context in Brazil? I'm referring to the Venezuela migration. Thank you, Jose Felix, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, for allowing uh, my team to be able to share and participate of this um, session that will surely create lots of information that will be very useful. Right. 
As our Colombian uh, brothers and sisters, we find challenges regarding migration. We had them before and we have them now. Of course, they are dependent. In terms of this, I could talk about frontiers or borders being um, shut down, which depends or deteriorates the situation for these people. Also, the fact that Brazil is very large, not only on the crossings or borders, but there is inner migration from state to state, which forces us as a national society to increase our uh, capabilities, to monitor in the best possible way what the situation is, and to follow up the um, movement's guidelines. That's where knowledge is generated, and also we can be aligned with response times, especially in the case of protection, for instance, that is an issue that is quite, quite um, marked regarding this. So we have many, many um, contribution opportunities and we strive to provide a response that is aligned uh, even within the national society. Felix, your uh, mic is muted. Ah, oh, sorry, thank you. Alvaro. So there is impact. We need to be able to uh, reflect this kind of migration that has been the biggest in the short time of history of the continent with significant figures over 5.5 million Venezuelans that are not in Venezuela. So not only are they in Brazil and Colombia, uh, neighboring countries, but this goes quite beyond this. And that's why I would like to also ask about the situation in Argentina, for instance, the southernmost country in our continent, the f one that is the further away, so what are the challenges like from uh, there? Elian, would you care to comment on this? Thank you, Jose. Uh, good morning. And I would like to say that what I've heard so far is quite clear uh, from a regional perspective and also the situation in Brazil and Colombia. Of course, the situation in Argentina, if we focus on Venezuela only, cannot compare to Colombia and Brazil. According to statistics by ACNUR, we have about 200,000 people that need international protection. And that's where we talk about asylum seekers, stateless people, refugees, people who need international protection. So compared to Colombia, we're speaking about 10% of people who need protection, as Alvaro was saying. So I think, Jose, what this is showing is that taking into account the geographical location of Argentina and these figures that are quite significant, although in relative and comparative terms to Colombia and Brazil they are, they show the scope of the humanitarian challenge that we face that is unprecedented and that has been deepened by COVID to a large extent. As I was saying, in Argentina, I was also saying 190,000 people in need of international protection, 90% of these people are Venezuelans. In the case of Argentina, uh, there's a open migratory uh, policy. These are people that don't have the refugee status. They do have a residency permit. So this does, in a way, mean that they still need protection. And uh, this year, 96% of those people who went through these uh, centers, aid centers, are from Venezuelan. So what happened? The flow 
grew from 5% of Venezuelan people in 2018, we moved on to 30. In 2017, we moved on to 30% in 2018, 96% in 2019, and this figure remained steady. And then COVID struck, and there's the pandemic and the government measures and the impact that this had in the Argentine economy, an economy that, as you all know, is quite, quite fragile. And this is where we can see that there's a striking ele element here. The migratory flow is lower in the case of Colombia, but the economic situation of Argentina that had already been going through a recession for about 10 years has been deeply affected by the pandemic, which has meant that we are facing a huge challenge in terms of humanitarian organizations that are working in the country and colleagues not only from madra but also from other organizations we work together in the field so i know this firsthand uh, the last thing that happened going back to the challenges that the country faces in the first place in march we were quarantined and that was the first challenge going back was to stabilize the response and to understand what was going on and what were the sectors within the population, the migrant population that needed a fast, uh, accurate answer. First, the situation of the border. From one day to the next, in our border in Bolivia, Brazil and such, many people started to live in the streets. The borders crossed, uh, there was no more transport, uh, so people were left uh, in places where they didn't want to stay. And this was crazy times. We needed to stabilize those people that were no longer receiving humanitarian aid. And then after having stabilized this situation, we started working on urban areas, especially in Buenos Aires, where 80% of the Venezuelan people is located. So what we've perceived there is first a growing need in order to provide a quality humanitarian uh, answer following SPHERE's guiding principles in the uh, realm of the quarantine uh this is a humanitarian situation that is um, growing and as this becomes more po complex there are other issues that are also um i'm afraid i'm listening to other people speaking at the same time so i cannot interpret And let me close by saying that as the humanitarian situation got more and more complex, we also saw, due to the impact of the pandemic in Argentinian economy, a great impact in the destruction of livelihoods. And we see that in the migrating population uh, that is um, the most affected in general, have seen his livelihood completely destroyed because they tend to work in the informal market um, and they are very vulnerable to this type of shock. So we, if we focus on challenges, I would like to focus on three points. First, regarding understanding uh, challenges as the humanitarian needs of the population. I would say that in Argentina today we have within the health sector there's a great concern regarding the mental health. Uh, I think with colleagues here we will be able to share this in terms of shelter a temporary as permanent shelters that we have problems due to the difficulties of paying for a rent, for example, and food security due to the destruction of livelihood. So I think those are the three big challenges that we are facing today. We have um, a lot of uncertainty in the future. We do not know what the 2021 holds for us is one of the biggest challenges of our time. Um, and uh, challenges for 2021 will increase. This is the general overview. Thank you very much, and back to you. 
Thank you, Eliane. This leads us to think a lot about our future. But before we close this question, I would also like to ask Alvaro, because we were focusing on the most evident, because migration is uh, quite evident for us who are uh, living in South America. But, but what is beyond migration? Marilyn mentioned, I wanted to ask Alvaro, how do you see other situations of migration, for example, in Brazil, migrants in Brazil? Thank you, Jose Felix. I would like